The Federal High School included a tennis and a basketball court. It also included a premium box seat for the guard on duty during sports competition. A small sports complex provided competition in basketball, wrestling and boxing. On some nights, the internees gathered to watch sumo wrestling movies. On the northeast corner of the camp, the softball diamond was surrounded by a football field, a soccer field, and a swimming pool. Very handy in the hot summer days in southwest Texas. This tank was not only of vital importance to the farm for irrigation purposes and essential to hygiene and sanitation, but it helped greatly to relieve the monotony of detention for teenagers and adults. And as you see, it was particularly beneficial to the children. At Crystal City, the INS administrators tried to make camp life as normal as possible, but security constantly reminded detainees of their lack of freedom. A 10-foot fence, guard towers, and floodlights surrounded the camp. Mounted guards patrolled the perimeter of the compound. A small police force was inside the camp at all times, and, incoming and outgoing vehicles were searched at the gate. Officials kept dossiers on each internee and conducted head counts every day in the housing units. All letters were censored. Prisoners met visiting friends or relatives under surveillance, although college students and American soldiers on vacation were allowed to stay with their parents. Security was a priority, Crystal City did not have any escape attempts. With so many internees, camp officials realized a need for medical services. In December 1942 the medical division was composed of two nurses and a 25-cent first aid kit. By July 1943 a 70-bed hospital and clinic operated 24 hours a day. Interny doctors performed more than a thousand major and minor operations and a Japanese pharmacist dispensed more than 30,000 prescriptions. Hundreds of babies were born at the detention center. By July 1945, hundreds of Germans and Japanese had been repatriated from Crystal City. More than a hundred had been released or paroled, 73 had been transferred to other camps, and 17 had died. In December 1945 more than 600 Peruvian Japanese left for Japan because the Peruvian government would not allow them to return to Peru. That same month, a similar number of Japanese were allowed to go home to Hawaii. Some prisoners resisted repatriation to Japan and were not allowed to return to Central and South America. In late 1947 the United States determined to let them stay. November 1, 1947, more than two years after the end of World War II, the Crystal City internment camp closed the last facility detaining alien enemies to do so. Two days after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the FBI, in cooperation with the governments of several Latin American countries, most notably Peru, Panama, and Nicaragua, began a campaign of abduction and deportation of more than 3,000 residents of Latin America. The majority of those deported, 2,264, were Latin Americans of Japanese descent. These innocent victims were targeted for their ethnicity, betrayed by their governments, abducted from their homes, and deported to the United States, far away from their family, friends, and culture. It was a racist scheme, it was an ethnic cleansing scheme, it was very, very dirty indeed. And 95% of Americans do not know it happened. And nine, those 95% of Americans need to know it happened. As the American public learns about Japanese-American internment during World War II, what remains a secret 
is the fact that the U.S. government went outside its borders to kidnap Latin Americans for hostage exchange with Japan. From 1941 to 1945, the U.S. government orchestrated the forced deportation of 2,264 men, women, and children of Japanese ancestry from 13 Latin American countries to be used as hostages in exchange for Americans held by Japan. Those targeted for abduction were prominent businessmen and community leaders. They were later followed by their family members. Of the Japanese Latin Americans who were abducted, about 1,800 or 80 percent were Japanese Peruvians. Libia Yamamoto, a former Japanese Peruvian internee, recalls her family's abduction. My father was first apprehended in January and then our family were given orders to leave. We went to Callao, boarded the ship there. It was a foreign ship that was manned by U.S. Army military p personnel. We were a little afraid getting on because the uh, soldiers all had rifles and pointing at us. Forced at gunpoint, families were transported by U.S. military personnel through the Panama Canal Zone and on to the United States. Alice Nishimoto remembers being processed upon arrival in New Orleans. When we arrived there, they stripped all the women and the children too, and we were sprayed with DDT like we were some kind of animal, so like we maybe had some disease. And so that was a very humiliating experience. And from there, we were transported by train to uh, Cuesta City, Texas, a detention camp. So when we arrived there, we, we saw these Japanese Americans already there. They welcomed us, and so they told us, this is where you're going to live. Although the three countries were allies in the war, once inside the camp, the Germans and Italians saw the Japanese as inferior to their superior white race and would have nothing to do with them. That was not all that welcomed them. For also found throughout the camp were hundreds of fire ant nests. These fire ants can be very aggressive when disturbed. They can inflict a very painful sting, which will swell up for days, with pain and itching. There were also a variety of stink bugs. The black type actually aiming at its target before shooting. Cockroaches were found in every building. And, house flies were everywhere. A scorpions, spiders, and tarantulas were no exception. These blister beetles could spray you while you slept, and the results would cause a lot of pain. Every now and then, you would come across a rattlesnake, and maybe a wild rabbit, attacking a rattlesnake. A roadrunner, watching the rabbit doing his job for him. <laughs> 